so much for the invitation and for coming here to my talk. Uh, this talk will be something of an overview. Um, maybe there will be some new results at the end, but I'm, my main goal is to overview a certain aspect of geometric representation theory and then at the end explain how it connects with the topic of this workshop. So let's start, you know, like many, uh, many geometric representation theory talks, let's start with the quiver. So the quiver is a directed graph and it will be fixed from this talk. You just need to remember that the set of vertices is going to be like denoted by i and the set of edges e. So a directed graph with vertices i and edges the directed going from i to j for various i and j. So this will be one of the, the fundamental objects in, in this line of geometric representation theory. So it's called the moduli stack of quiver representation. And if you don't like the word stack, then let me point out, first of all, how it's defined, and then I'll say what it is. So you fix an i-tuple of non-negative integers v. So v is a choice of a non-negative integer vi for every vertex of the quiver. And then here's what you do. You take the direct sum of the affine space of homomorphisms from e to the power vi to c to the power vj, that a direct sum which you see in the middle of the formula is a big affine space, you know, affine space of uh, some, some number of dimensions, and then you quotient it by the action of a direct product of general linear groups. So geometrically, this uh, stack is very mild. It is an affine space modulo the action of GLV, essentially. So it is a very, very tame a stack. So if you don't like to think about stacks, just think of it as an affine space with a group action. Now here's what this is from a representation theoretic point of view. Points of the stack are representations of the quiver, which happen to have dimension v. So what this means is that for each vertex of the quiver, you have a vi dimensional vector space living on that vertex. So just think of the vector space cvi as living above the vertex i then for every edge, you get to choose a homomorphism from the vector space at i to the vector space at j, and if you have a multiple edges between i and j, then you get to choose multiple homomorphisms. So in doing so, you have chosen a representation of the quiver. Basically, a choice of linear maps for every arrow in the quiver. But you are only taking these up to isomorphisms, so you are identifying two quiver representations if they are the same up to conjugation by something in the general linear group. So this is what that product of GLVIs is doing. Uh, basically, you have the freedom of acting... Yeah. I think it's because it's not plugged in and it decides to... Uh... Sorry. I should cut my explanations a bit short. The, <laughs> the point is that um, the action of GLVI on these on these homomorphisms is by conjugation. So GLVI acts on the vector spaces CVI, so therefore it acts on homomorphisms by you know, multiplication on the domain and on the target and, Sorry. and inverse multiplication on the domain. Anyway, so this is what the moduli stack of uh, of quiver representations is. Its points are representations of the quiver up to isomorphism. All right, so this was all for the quiver. Now we're going to do something that uh, morally corresponds to doubling a quiver. So instead of thinking about Q as having an arrow from I to J, every time you see this arrow from I to J, you add an arrow in the opposite direction. So the doubled a quiver always has as many arrows going from I to J as from J to I. And if you do this doubling business, you might be led to the following object. So you can define a more complicated moduli I stack as follows. Um, you take this big affine space here, and if you think about this big affine space, it really is the same as the set of homomorphisms for Q, but for the double quiver, because now you have a homomorphism in the direction of the arrow IJ, and also a homomorphism back. But you don't just take this big affine space. Instead, you take this quadratic map, which takes which goes from the affine space of homomorphisms to the direct sum of endomorphisms of the vi's, and the quadratic map is given by this formula. So if you want to, to see what this map does to a collection of xe homomorphisms here and ye homomorphisms here, it sends it to essentially the commutator of xe and ye. 
with the caveat that you know commutator is defined in a slightly more general sense because x c y e is going to go from c v j to c v j and y e x e is going to go from c v i to c v i and they all land in the in, in, in the appropriate correct sum and the right hand side so basically there's a single way to define this linear map in a, in a way which is consistent now if you do this then you define the moduli space M V not as the affine space of homomorphisms modulo product of GLVs, but you define it as the inverse image of zero modulo the product of GLVs. So basically what this is is it is an affine subvariety cut off by quadratic equations in affine space modulo the action of the, of a product of general linear groups. And if, if this is the first time you see this, you might say, well, I love the moduli stack of quiver representations because it made a lot of sense. It really was like um, a representation of the quiver modulo isomorphism. So what do points of this thing mean? What, 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 what is our reason for defining, for considering this object? Well, one of the reasons we like to consider it is that in a, you know, in a an algebraic geometry sense, this MV is actually the cotangent bundle to the stack rem V. So if you forget about the, the stacks uh, for a second and think of these as just as algebraic varieties, which they're not, but if they were, then the cotangent bundle to rev v would be mv. The dimension of mv is double the dimension of rev v. And this is going to be, to be a key fact for lots of the geometric constructions which happen, which, are, which we're going to see in this talk, particularly in the second half. So it's very important that we work with something whose dimension is twice as much as that of rem v, and the natural choice is this m v. Well, here's an example. The most interesting uh, basic example in my book is the case when q is the Jordan quiver. So the Jordan quiver, uh, by definition, it has a single vertex, and at that vertex it has a single loop. So one vertex, one edge, but it just so happens that that edge points from the vertex to itself, so it's a loop. In this case, if you pass through the definition, a point in rep V is none other than a V by V a matrix, but considered up to conjugation. So points of, of rep V are square matrices, modulo conjugation, and if you think about what this is, well, this is in one-to-one -one correspondence with Jordan normal forms. So in a very point-wise heading, giving a matrix modulo a conjugation is the same thing as giving a collection of, of Jordan blocks, and this is, you know, a theorem on Jordan normal forms. So the study of rep V is like a stacky way to, um, to think about Jordan normal forms, which are the great geometers to do that, completely like. So what is MV? Well, MV is going to be a little bit more exciting. So a point in MV is a pair of square matrices, X and Y, and then you have that, that condition that the pair X, Y lie in mu inverse of zero. Well, lying in mu inverse of zero just means that the commutator of x, y is zero, and then you quotient this by the general linear group, so you consider these pairs of matrices up to conjugation which commute, and this is called the commuting stack. It's quite interesting in, uh, it's quite interesting in geometric representation theory. People sometimes study this uh, without a quotient by GLV or with the quotient by GLV, but it is, it is definitely an object that people study, and it's a little bit more complicated than FFP. So these are the most interesting basic examples of, of, of these moduli spaces in my book, and there are, are many others, of course. Okay, so we have some moduli spaces, and now the question is, what do we do with them? Let me start by defining this, this object called the K-theoretic whole algebra. So first of all, I have to say what K-theory means in this context. So think of K-theory as a, a slightly fancier version of cohomology. Uh, if you're happy with considering the cohomology of varieties, then it's a certain leap to, to accepting the cohomology of stacks, but those are slightly more complicated algebraic spaces. Uh, and then, then instead of cohomology, let's think about a K theory, which is like a slightly more complicated notion. I'm sweeping under a rug the fact that um, my K theory groups are going to be equivalent and localized. And I don't think these words are very important for the, uh, you know, for the a survey aspect of this talk, but if anyone has questions about the specific meanings of the words localization and equivariance in my book, then feel free to ask me, but I will not mention these words again. So, here's what we do. Take these moduli stacks in some kind of geometric spaces. Take 
and there are k theory groups. I will take these groups with q coefficients, or with coefficients in some field. Then I get some <coughs> vector space for each MV. And then we take the direct sum of these vector spaces when V goes over all dimensional vectors. This thing, the resulting object, is going to be a big vector space, say, a big graded vector space which is graded by the monoid n to the power i. So that said, we don't just want this to be a vector space, we want this to be an algebra. And the algebra structure on this thing is quite interesting. It's, it's not what you would expect from the usual multiplication in cohomology or key theory. Usual cup product in cohomology or tensor product in K-theory would act on the K-theory of MV for a given V. It would somehow stay within the graded sum ends of this algebra. But the algebra structure we want on A is not like that. We want an algebra structure which takes something in the V th sum end and multiplies it with something in the V prime th sum end and lands in the V plus V prime th sum end. That is a convolution of product. It is, the definition of this convolution product is a little bit technical and I don't want to present it in this talk. It keeps, it involves understanding certain stacks of extensions of quiver representations. So instead of just considering the single quiver representations, you consider short exact sequences of quiver representations. The idea is in considering this particular object um, geometrically, you know, it goes back to people working about this, these in the 90s and 2000s. I think it was, formalized for the George um, Quiver in a paper of Schiffman and Basro, and the construction was uh, was done in complete generality for all quivers by Yang and Zhao, you know, um, checked all the properties of this convolution product and defined it in the most, uh, in all technical details. But the, the intuition behind the, this object goes back probably 30 years or so. And we will see in a bit that it's quite closely connected to how she does work on, on quiver varieties, but that's in the second half. All right, here's a theorem, which from us again is based on the ideas of many people. Uh, I'm only listing a few of all the people who worked on this, and I will list other people who have worked on this when we talk about her varieties. So there is an isomorphism of algebras between this algebra and a purely representation theoretic object called UQLG+. So this isomorphism features in a slightly different language in the work of Groszynowski in a preprint from maybe the mid uh, 90s in AD type where he, he connected it with um, with the realization of quantum loop groups of loose state. Uh, Schiffman has proved the version of this for the Jordan quiver. And you know my involvement with this is that I was interested in proving this for general quivers. But before I tell you what uh, the statement is, I have to explain what the object on the right is. So G plus is half of the Katz-Moody algebra corresponding to the quiver Q. Here's how this works. If you have a simple finite dimensional D algebra, it has a Dinkin diagram. So there's like a one-to-one -one correspondence between simple finite dimensional D algebras and, and Dinkin diagrams. More generally, if instead of just one of the finitely many families of Dinkin diagrams, you consider an arbitrary graph, you can associate to that graph a Katz-Moody algebra. So you have an object which you call G, and G plus happens to be half of that cast moving the algebra. So you have a E algebra associated with Q. Then LG plus is loops into the D algebra. So it's going, it has going to be the D algebra of Laurent polynomials in T with coefficients in G plus. And the Q in UQ of LG plus is a Q version. I'm not going to say a deformation. I, I don't want to make any false statements. But UQLG plus is a Q version of the universally enveloping algebra of the Lie algebra G plus T plus minus 1. So the object on the right hand side is a very well known object. This thing is a very well known object in, in representation theory when and the quiver is of finite type and of affine type. And you know, my involvement with, 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 with this theorem is to to define this object for general types. And you, you want to, to define UQLG plus for general quivers in such a way that it be isomorphic to A. So I can say a little bit more about this isomorphism in general types, but it is a bit technical, so maybe I don't want to um, for burning the talk just now. The moral of the statement is that as, as was expected by people for many, many years, you know, 20, 30 years, way more than that, and I've been working on in this 
in this part of geometric representation theory, you have this algebra which is defined geometrically, this A, and it happens to be asymorphic with an algebra that is defined completely representation theoretically, something called the quantum loop. So that, that is very interesting to me. I'm going to, to move on to Nakajima with her varieties now, but if there are any questions about this pretty abstract statement, I think that would be a good time. Sorry, what does half mean? Half means in the same sense as um, half of SLN is upper triangular matrices. So G plus is like the analog of upper triangular matrices. Okay, so let's connect all of this with quiver varieties. You know, uh, stacks are, are abstract, but you know, I, I, I should speak in my own name, but people tend to like high varieties more. So here's how to get a variety out of this as Nakajima teaches us. So you don't just take a single dimension vector V. Remember that V is a big I tuple of non-negative integers. You take two big I tuple of non-negative integers, V and W, and they will play the different roles in the construction which is the come. You have in the left-hand side of this map the same kind of vector space as we have as we had before. So this direct sum over all edges, homomorphisms from from i to j and from j to i. But you also include a second family of homomorphisms, which go from, which correspond to a, to a single vertex of the quiver, and the, the, the homomorphisms in the second tensor product, they go from an auxiliary vector space of dimension wi to the vector space of dimension vi and back. And I will, I will label the four types of homomorphisms which appear in the left-hand side of this of this diagram by x, e, y, e, these are indexed by edges of the quiver, and a, i, b, i, they, these are indexed by vertices of the quiver. And then you construct the, uh, the, the a quadratic map, which is, takes such a quadruple x, y, a, b, and it sends it to this expression over here. So the same kind of, of commutator as before, but then you add the sum of a, i, i, b, i. And this is going to be extremely important, because if you do this, Mm, Habajima tells us how to consider a, a certain subset of open, um, a certain open subset of stable points inside this mu inverse of zero, such that when you take the closed subset given by the condition that mu is zero, and you intersect it with the so-called open subset of stable quadruples, which I won't tell you what it is, when you do that, and you take the quotient by GLVI, then you actually get a sub variety, and, 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 and you just get an algebraic variety. Um, so this is the statement which I'm asking you to, to believe that this particular quotient now exists not in this abstract world of stacks, but it, that it is actually a nicely behaved algebraic variety, and in the generality which I want to work with, it's going to be smooth. So it's actually going to be a, a great algebraic variety to work with. I want to emphasize the a different roles played by the V vector spaces and the W vector spaces in this picture. So, um, because of, of intuition that comes to us from physics, the V vector spaces are called uh, gauge vector spaces, and the W vector spaces are, are called uh, framing vector spaces. And this GLVI, it only acts on the gauge vector spaces. So then, when you ask me, how does a, a certain I tuple of elements of general linear groups act on X, Y, A, B, I'm going to answer, it acts in all the possible ways it can act on these maps, given the fact that they are automorphisms of the V vector spaces and not of the W vector spaces. So there's actually only one reasonable way in which they can act. Okay, so we have this great uh, thing called with her varieties, and the algebra that we defined earlier, this algebra A, which is, you know, defined with respect to a stacky version of this, of, of, of the square variety, it happens to act on the direct sum over V of the K-theory groups of these actual algebraic varieties for any W. So, in other words, fixed W, then you get an action of A on this thing. For fixed a W, but V is allowed to run in this direct sum. So basically, you get a collection of representations of A, which are indexed IW. And this action is very explicit. It is given in terms of Nakajima's correspondences. Now, the reason why I say that this 
follows ideas of many people is because I couldn't fit it on this slide. So basically, um, if you ask me in the language that the algebra A acts on this K-theory group, I, I, I think it boils down to the paper of Schiffman and Vastro in, um, in, um, in case of the Jordan paper, but this is just like a slight difference in language from Nakajima's original construction who realized the quantum loop group as um, as a certain Hagrachian correspondence in the product of n with itself. So these two languages are quite quite similar with each other. And Hagrachim has work also um, followed some particular cases in the mid-90s, which were worked, worked out by Ginsburg, Asro, and Baraniolo. I think they mostly worked on stuff like Taipei flag varieties or cyclic, a cyclic quiver. But Hakajima's construction is quite general. And I think nowadays people understand his construction by the Lagrangian correspondences and the construction of the action of that algebra A on these things is like two facets of really the same. So I couldn't really hit all of this, uh, all of this business into one slide, so I'm just explaining it. And of course, the, the history of this of this action is quite long. But you know, mathematically, we had an algebra on the previous slide, and now we have a, a lot of representations for it. One representation for any choice of W. So we can do a lot of representation theory. Okay. So this will lead us into a second realization of of, of this algebra, and this is going to be the main uh, the main geometric construction which I want to talk about today. So you can get an algebra on these things by doing the, um, the construction you've seen a few slides ago. So let me actually remind you what that construction was. Basically, we have this algebra that is defined as the direct sum of things like this when V ran over the entire monoid and I, and on the previous slide I said that this thing acted on the key theory of Nakajima quiver varieties for all W. So this was like the key upshot of what we saw on the previous slide. This is N V W for all Ws. So let me remind you that this is the stacky thing. It's called the um, the pre-projective stack these days, but it, it, the name for it is not, it's not as established as that for quiver varieties. So you can think of it as like a framing and stability less version of quiver varieties. So this was the upshot of the previous slide. For the remainder of this talk, I'd like to give you something that people I believe is an equivalent version of this construction. And it was, it appeared in a, a a number of papers constructed by Ganajic, Hauli, Kakunkov, and Smirnov, um, who define certain maps called stable envelopes that will allow us to come up with a geometric alternative to the algebra A and to its action on the key theory of the varieties. For a little bit of history, the original construction of Hauli and Kakunkov was in cohomology. Kakunkov and Smirnov worked out the key theory version and they laid out quite a lot of the of properties of the key theoretic version of these table envelopes, and this will be the one that, that we will encounter in this talk. And then a paper of Aganajic and, and Hakunkov, they, um, they wrote the version of this elliptic homology and also established the existence of these table envelope maps for quiver varieties. So that's why I'm citing them all together, because really the, um, the construction I'm about to show you now is a very, very big construction, which took a number of years to develop to its current stage much like a construction of this business, actually. So here's how to define a construction. I'm actually going to give you a, as close a definition I can given the circumstances of this, of such a short talk, and I'm, I'm going to try and keep it non-technical, but I want to give you the geometric flavor. So here's what you do. You, you take two, two W vectors of on negative integers. And, rem and remember that in terms of quiver varieties, these can these correspond to the to the framing of vector spaces of Nakajima quiver varieties. 
So you fix the W and W prime, so W is the I tuple of WIs, and W prime is the I tuple of WI prime, and I'm going to consider a rank one a torus inside this big product of general linear groups. And I want to draw your attention to the fact that these GLs are the opposite of the GLs that we saw in the definition of quimer varieties. Those were GLVs. This one is GLW. It is the GL general linear group corresponding to the other vector spaces. Now, the definition of this rank one torus is quite easy. So, so basically, it's, it's that and home, home matrices in a fixed basis, which are like 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 uh, WI times, and then T, 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 WI pi times, times, and then everywhere else is zero. And you do this for every one of the i factors of, 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 of the product of GLs, and you get a RAM1 torus. Now, how do you do with this? Well, GL WI plus WI prime acts on this Nakajima quiver variety. And it does so essentially because we had a W, we had framing vector spaces in the definition of Nakajima quiver varieties, the ones which are indexed by C to the WI, and you can always act with an automorphism of these vector spaces on, on the quiver varieties themselves in terms of the representation of quiver varieties as spaces of quadruples X, Y, A, B, a certain product of GLWs will leave X and Y unchanged and it will only act on the A and B components. But anyway, the product of GLs acts on Akajima quiver varieties and therefore in particular, so does this rank one's up torus. So you have a rank one torus which acts on N with same thing vector W has W prime, and you can ask, what is the fixed point set of this action? And it so happens that the fixed point set of this action is a product of quiver varieties for smaller framing vectors. So in other words, taking the fixed point set of this action, it breaks a framing by vector space in W plus W prime into a product of a quiver variety for framing vector W times a quiver variety for framing vector W prime. And the only thing you have to do now is you have to take the disjoint union here because if you break this framing vector into W and W prime, you should also be prepared to break the gauge vector, this uh, tilde, into V and V prime in all possible ways. So it's a fact, and this is actually a, a relatively easy geometric exercise to show that the fixed point set of this rank one torus is exactly what I wrote at the point. Now, uh, on the next page, I will show you how to, how to use this geometry to give the stable envelope maps. But before doing so, I want to point out that you have the action of a rank 1 torus on an algebraic variety. You can think of the orbits of this rank 1 torus, which are copies essentially of C star inside the given variety. You can think of them as flowing from t is equal to infinity to t is equal to 0. Now you might say, there's no infinity and zero in C star, indeed. But if you take the closure of these orbits, some orbits are closed, and that's how orbits do have closures in this uh, in this quiver variety. So the notion of the point at infinity and the point at zero is going to be well defined for some orbits. But intuitively, just think of of there being a flow on this Nakajima quiver variety being induced by the action of the rank one torus T and think of the flow direction as going from infinity to zero. So why do we care about this? Well, this will allow us, and this is the key construction of Aganaji <coughs> and Morgan, this will allow us to, to consider a certain important sub-variety. So it's, it, it's going to be called the full attracting sub-variety. And it lives inside a product of three Nakajima quiver varieties. So first of all, there's the one with framing a W plus W prime, then the one with framing W, and then the one with framing a W prime. So this full attracting sub-variety is, is defined as, as the space of triples X, Y, Z. So the implication is that X is in the first then, Y is in the second then, and Z is in the third end, with the property that you can that you can go from X to the pair YZ by flowing along finitely many closures of the orbits. Let me, because um, I was unable to, make, to draw this picture on my slides, let me show you how it works in, uh, let me draw a picture. So, think of this, 
picture as living inside n um, d tilde w plus w prime. And you can think of this thing as being the fixed point set, which we remember is n v w times n v prime w prime. So the flow, going over his flow of closed orbits from infinity to zero, is going to attract things toward a fixed locus. So you might have an orbit which flows into this fixed point, and it might so happen that this orbit actually has you know, it can actually be completed for P1 at the other end. So it might so happen that there are two points in this moduli space, which are like the t is equal to zero and t is equal to infinity versions of um, um, t is equal to zero and t is equal to infinity limits of this flow. And it might so happen that they be connected by such a, by such a t orbit and then this point might have the same property. There might be another t orbit which is flowing into it, and so on. And there might be a finite chain of such t orbits. And <coughs> a last orbit in this chain, we allow it to be half half closed. So we only we require it to be closed on this on this vertex, but it might have it might be open on the opposite vertex. And here we require there to be the point x. So the definition of ATTR is the space of triples x, y, z such that you can travel from the point x to the point y, z inside this ambient algebraic variety along these flow lines. So the meaning of this is that if you start from x and, and you turn on the a t action, then you take the limit as t goes to zero and you might find yourself falling into this point. Now, if you continue acting with a torus at this point, you will stay there because it's a fixed point, it's a, it's a limit. But you may, you are allowed to slightly perturb it and then continue the flow line from the perturbation and then you might land in, in a different fixed point. And you do this finitely many times and you might end up in y commas. So but by definition, ATDR is the set of triples x, y, z which are connected by this kind of geometry which I'm drawing on the board. Somewhat into it. Is there, are there any questions about the geometry over here? I don't want to make it too precise, but this is what people call the full attracting subvariety. The usual attracting subvariety is simply the set of triples x, y, z such that x flows into y, z. But this more complicated thing is where x flows into something, which flows into something, which flows into something, dot, 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 finally many times, which flows into y, z. So it is a slightly more general and an interesting notion, if you ask me. Okay, so what do we do with this? Well, the, the people who, do, who develop the theory of stable envelopes, they define certain classes called stable envelopes. So I will only be interested in, in two of these classes. Actually, consider uh, the stable envelopes that they consider actually depend on the number of parameters, but these will not be important for the purposes of this talk. I will just care about two of them. A stab and stab a prime. So these are key theory classes on these attracting subvarieties. And once again, if you're not, if you don't like key theory classes, then think of these as cohomology classes. There is a cohomology, there is a cohomology version of this uh, of this construction. And if you think about these as cohomology classes, then they are like linear combinations of subvarieties of A of ATTR. And actually, I think it will be more like linear combinations of reducible components of ATTR. Several cases. So the so stab and stab prime are certain explicit cycles that are actually much more explicit than the definition I'm giving you on this slide. But so assume now that we have these classes called stable envelopes, and then the question is, what do we do with them? How can we do this? We construct this rather complicated thing. So this so this is the key construction which goes back to the work of Molik and Akunkov in cohomology, if you have these classes called stable envelopes, you can construct so-called geometric car matrices. And before you look at this, uh, at, you know, this complicated formula over there, I should draw a diagram for you. So ATTR, remember, it was a subvariety of N V tilde W plus W prime times N V W 
times n v prime w prime, and it has projection maps p1 and p2. p1 is the a projection to the big factor, so n with framing w plus w prime, and p2 is the one to the other two factors. So n v w times n v prime w prime. I apologize, I couldn't fit this diagram into the slide. So here's the meaning of this of these geometric R matrices. For the purpose of doing geometric representation theory, you want a linear map from here to here. That's what an R matrix is. It is a linear map on a tensor product of two representations. Well, we know that K of NVW is like a representation for an algebra, so an R matrix should be a linear map from this tensor this to this tensor this. Now, how do you, how do you construct such an interesting linear map well, if all I give you are these, are these key theory classes on ATTR, you can play this game of pull back and push forward to get yourself from these key theory groups to the key theory of ATTR and back. And the game you play is the following. So, we'll start from a class here. You pull it, you pull it back to ATTR. You multiply it by stab, just tensor product in K theory, with the class stab, you push it forward here, then you pull back here, you multiply it with stab prime, and finally you push forward to n to, to this space here in the corner. So basically if I told you, draw me a diagram which involves ATTR, takes the, the classes a stab and stab prime into account, and does two pullbacks and two push forwards, then this is the only reasonable composition you could write. Now you might ask why on earth would we care about this? Well, in, in geometric representation theory, quite often we see maps which arise as correspondences, and correspondences are always a pull-push diagram. Essentially, this is a composition of two correspondences, because each correspondence is, is a composition of a pullback and a push-forward. Here we have two pullbacks and two push-forwards, so this is a composition of two correspondences. Right, so we have these geometric R matrices, and what will we do with them? Well, they will allow us to define an algebra, and when I say us, I mean Pauli Kagunkowski and Novena Galagic. Uh, they allow us to construct an algebra. It's going to be a subalgebra in the endomorphism ring of Kn, V, which is generated by all matrix coefficients of the big thing on the previous slide in the second tensor factor. So. This I probably need to explain a bit. So you have this, this big composition over here, and ultimately think of this as a linear map from this tensor that to this tensor that. I'm only interested in maps acting on this. So I can use a that as an auxiliary space. So what I can do is I can take any vector here, any co-vector here, for any v prime and any w prime, I can pre-compose this big thing with the given vector here and post-compose with the cone vector here and then I will just get a linear map from this to this. So basically, whenever you have a linear map on a tensor product, by pre- and post-composing with an arbitrary vector and co-vector in here, you can get tons of linear maps on k and v compound w. And on the next slide, by taking the algebra of endomorphisms which are generated by these so-called maps which are called matrix coefficients, you get an algebra which naturally acts on the k-theory of n, v, w. Well, technically speaking, on the direct sum of all these k-theories over v, but I was kind of sweeping this under the rug. So this, um, this is a geometric version of the FRT construction. Where from a uh, from an R matrix you construct an algebra. All right, so now we have two algebras which act on the same representation. So we have this algebra A, which was very geometrically defined, and it acted on the direct sum of k and v over v for all w. But the algebra A tilde does the exact same thing, and it does the exact same thing because it is defined as a certain subalgebra in the endomorphism ring. So it tautologically comes with an action on the exact same representation as before. So this is the punchline of all of this is that people have always, have often, you know, for the last uh, 10 years almost, have expected that these two algebras be isomorphic. 
And not only should the algebra Z and A tilde be isomorphic, the isomorphism should intertwine their actions on the key theory groups of Nakajima and varieties. So this is the expectation. I mean, it's such a, a common expectation that I'm not even stating it as a conjecture. It's, it's just like uh, everybody believes that. So, you know, everybody he believes that, but there hasn't been much progress on it. The only thing I, I, I can say is a paper I wrote a few months ago where I can construct an injective map from this algebra A to the algebra A tilde. You know, I, I can prove injectivity, which maybe is not all that impressive. But the, the most important thing for me is that to get objectivity, you can boil this down to, to the computation of something which um, I will call not called the slope zero co-product that corresponds to, to stable envelopes. Now, I'm writing this because I think the computation of the slope zero co-product is the most interesting thing. It is a computation that people essentially only know how to do uh, for quivers of finite type and the Jordan quiver. If someone were to do the, the computation of this slope zero whole product, which is not something that I will explain in this talk because I don't have time, I mean, you would prove a, a conjecture that A and A tilde are isomorphic, and that's great. But I think computing this would give rise to some formulas which would be very beautiful in geometric representation theory. So my, uh, you know, my attempt to popularize this conjecture is not just to say, prove this conjecture that A and A tilde are isomorphic, but try to prove it in this way, by computing this co-product, because if you compute this co-product, you will give rise to formulas for all quivers, <coughs> sorry about that, formulas for all quivers that people um, have only seen in finite types and in the, in, in the case of a Jordan quiver. Now, this is my last slide, and uh, I, I will finish, I want to say a little bit about what this has to do with the subject of this workshop, which is, which is essentially elliptic quantum loops. So uh, there are three types of, um, of R matrices with respect to a parameter. There are so-called rational, econometric, and elliptic types. And the key theory stuff in geometric representation theory that you have seen is a trigonometric version. It is the middle version in this hierarchy. And this is what I've been what I, I have been speaking about. The rational version of all of this has to do with replacing the K theory by cohomology everywhere. And the analogous picture to what you've seen already exists, even though, technically speaking, the study of cohomology and K theory is somewhat different. And I don't know how to write um, an analog of my results for cohomology, but there are other ways to prove the cohomological version of these conjectures. Um, there's a paper of Schiffman and Vassarov from like five or six years ago where they essentially establish a, a result which is similar to mine and K-theory, but they do so by very different means. So the point is, cohomology and K-theory are technically, are philosophically very similar, but technically somewhat difficult. And some things which work in one of them don't work in the other. So, uh, you know, they are, are comparable, but technically speaking, there are differences. But the thing which I think would be the most interesting is coming up with an elliptic generalization of this. So in my talk, we had quantum loop groups, we had the algebra A, which was defined by geometric representation theory, and we had its action on the K-theory of Nakajima quiver varieties. Elliptic versions of all of this would be to come up with an elliptic quantum group, which is already known, uh, like in the work of Hitoshi and, and his co-authors, um, study an elliptic version of the key theoretic whole algebra, and this is something which is technically challenging, and then study its action on the elliptic cohomology of Nagajima quiver varieties, which has worked out in the paper of Akanaji Shikaku. Now, this, you know, you might think that it is similar to what happens in the key theory case, and philosophically that's true, but from a technical point of view, connecting the elliptic cohomology of quiver varieties, which is a very geometric thing, with the, the elliptic quantum groups that people in this audience have studied, that is a very non-trivial task. And I personally don't know how to do it. And I really wish someone who is well-versed in, in both elliptic cohomology and in elliptic quantum groups can finally work out the, the explicit connection between these things, but it's quite non-trivial. So I don't want to minimize the technical challenges which go into this. Thank you.
I have recently obtained a error operator as a construct of the uh, by using the type 1 and the type uh, but it's split of G intertwine uh, elliptic quantum group uh, module of elliptic quantum group uh, we, we use type 1 and type 2 dual operator Combining that two operators, uh, we can construct an uh, error operator. And I, I have recently obtained an uh, uh, error operator for uh, any cyclic equipment. Right? And uh, perhaps I wish to compare. <laughs> so I, ideally, it would be great if these operators could also be obtained from the, the geometric R matrices. Mm -hmm. so, but, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, uh, work has to be done. For R metrics, I follow the open copies argument. It is given by uh, starting first star. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then I, I found uh, consistent vertex, vertex operators, uh, type 1, type 2, dual, as a data in our uh, quantum toroidal. Uh, it's actually elliptic quantum toroidal algebra for cyclic feedback case. Uh, in that one, uh, module of such quantum algebra, uh, and con con in a consistent way to the known uh, elliptic state envelope for right. so, so this is a great indication that you know we are on the right track, and one should expect an isomorphism between an elliptic quantum groups and you know these particular Ganajish Maori Kamukov of construction. I mean, ultimately, you don't just want a, an abstract isomorphism between these, but you want an isomorphism which intertwines all possible structures, the Hopf algebra, the representations and everything, and which identifies geometrically defined R matrices with whatever algebraically defined R matrices that you can consider. And in that case, you know, a prescription of this would be that, for example, the L operators that you can get geometrically should correspond to something that one can get purely algebraically. So by establishing these kinds of, of connections, he's, this is, is more and more evidence of the isomorphism. But, you know, moving to isomorphism is quite challenging. Uh, can you construct elliptic Schubert polynomials? I, uh, I wonder if it has been done in other people. I mean, I, I've never studied them, but probably if you consider, if you consider the particular case of the grass manual, Varieties you can realize them in the analytic homology. You, you mean you can construct the well, functions? Well, did you say Schubert polynomials? Oh, okay. I thought you asked um, how Schubert polynomials are. I apologize if I misunderstood. Perhaps the uh, elliptic uh, several envelope is an extension of a Schubert uh, polynomial. So the question is for which kind of of quiver varieties. So you can do this with a quiver variety is the cotangent with a Grassmannian, or you can do it with a quiver variety is the Hipper scheme, and I think either of these would give rise to classical objects. I think the Schubert and Schubert polynomials are each equal zero limits of the table and blocks. Sure. And in the elliptic case, they, they have holes at each equal zero. So that's why there is no elliptic Schubert calculus. Okay, that. Uh, is how do they complete the list? Yeah. Well, maybe I, I go ask. Yeah. Because elliptic analog of sure functions was constructed by Masatoshi Naomi uh, several years ago, and I want to ask is it possible to connect with uh, uh, your approach to elliptic homology, because as, as I know, um, I'm not sure, uh, there are no uh, real uh, definition of what is elliptic homology. No description of what is the ring of elliptic homology. I would be a bit more optimistic and say that there are a number of definitions and the challenge is, is establishing the fact that they are isomorphic. Uh, to answer your, your question, I personally have not work on elliptic homology, so I, I don't know if I, I wouldn't know how to establish this, but I think it would be great if, uh, if you could realize these things in the elliptic homology of quicker varieties. You know, it, it's not, as people find 
added geometry tree slaughtering per se, but some sheaves on uh, products of elliptic curves. And then even getting from this to the, the definition of elliptic quantum groups, which are a little bit more classical, I would say it's a bit challenging to me. So um, I think your question is highly contributing. But I personally don't have anything to say about it because I've never worked on the elliptic homology of the well, maybe I ask, uh, because uh, elliptic cohomology should be related, as any cohomology theory should be related with the, uh, some uh, map from universal formal groups to the elliptic group. Right, yeah. uh, do you know what is the uh, genetic interpretation of map from Barbizum to elliptic cohomology? I mean, I think that's how you get the definition of elliptic cohomology. So it's like you, you, there's a formal group law which gives rise to regular cohomology and the K theory, and then there's a particular map which gives, which gives rise to the oh, cohomology.